Hey man. Want some chips? Um, sure. Jeremy, what are you doing? What's that? I said, what are you doing? I'm, uh, I'm counting my carbs. With an abacus? Yeah, man. You got some better way to do it? Yeah. Watch the next session. Yeah? Well, um, can I keep my abacus, though? If you want. Weirdo. Hi, everyone. My name is Adriana Valencia. Thank you all for joining in, joining in on the presentation today. Today, my topic is carb counting when eating out. What we're going to be talking about today, we're going to review some different ideas and tips for helping with um, carb counting when you're eating something different or on vacation. Um, so that's going to be what we're going to be talking about today. So I want you to kind of think of this question. What are some of your favorite things about vacation time? I bet some of you are thinking family time, maybe no, I don't have to cook during this vacation time. Maybe you're thinking relaxation, um, exploring new places. And I bet somewhere in that list of vacation favorites also um, popped into your mind, you thought about food, right? So here's just a kind of enticing picture of some different foods that you might eat when on vacation, right? So, or even, um, some different things that you might try at a, at a restaurant. So many times when we travel, we tend to try many different foods. And now whether you're traveling or you're just eating at a new restaurant with your family, it's important to still try and stay on track with your blood sugar goals. Uh, I get many questions about what the best way to estimate carbs is when eating out. It can be difficult to do, but like I said, we're going to go through some ideas and strategies to kind of help you really hone in on your carb estimates. So first I'll ask you, why do you think that carb counting is so difficult to do? So even us dietitians have a really hard time carb counting, if that makes you feel any better about it. There was a study conducted in uh, May of 2018 that found that as the meal size increases, that also means that the error of margin and carb counting also tends to increase. So that means the larger the meal, the, the more variation we tend to have in, in our carb counting estimation. Um, and there was also a study conducted in Central Europe that found it was most difficult to estimate carbs in things like pasta, chips, and rice. And as you all know, those are also the most carb heavy foods. So carb counting isn't an easy thing to master. So I kind of like to tell patients that there's these three layers to carb counting. I think the first step is that number one would be identifying what foods contain carbohydrates in them. The second step would be becoming more aware of the serving sizes. Example, if you have a bagel, you'll say, okay, that's 55 grams of carb. First step would be identifying the bagel would have carbohydrates. The second step would be identifying the serving size of that. And the third step is accounting for fat and protein content of a meal. Now today we're going to focus more on number two and number three. If you're new to carb counting, you may still be working on number one and that's okay. That's a good place to start. It's very important. And the sake of time, we will not be reviewing step one today. So to start with identifying serving sizes of carbs, um, there are some great applications that you can download on your phone. You can also access these from a desktop um, as well. There are many applications out there that are available. And of course, you're welcome to use whatever you feel works best for you. These are the two that I will be touching on with you today that we'll review. Um, one is called Figwe. It's the little green F that you see there. And then Calorie King is the one on the other side with the magnifying glass. Now these photos are the little widgets that you'll find for them in your um, application store if you go to your little store on your phone, you can search Figwe or Calorie King and this is the little uh, pictures that will pop up for them. So first we're gonna start with Calorie King. Now it's a free application on your phone as I mentioned, it can also be accessed from a computer. It has a really large database, which is why I like it. 
I also like that you don't need to create an account or log in to it, which is nice. So you don't have to put your email or anything in. Now, I will say the downfall to the phone app is that um, it has a lot of ads on the free version. So you'll notice that the ads do pop up much more than they used to. So you can do an in-app purchase so you can pay so those apps are not there, but it's up to you. I just wanted to let you know because some people really don't like the ads coming up. So the way that Calorie King works is you can search in a database. So I just did some screenshots so you can see what it looks like. So on the search bar, all I put in was the word watermelon. And you can see that it says average of all brands on one of the photos. And then it shows watermelon raw. It shows watermelon slush, um, some different watermelon candy on the bottom. So I just clicked on the raw watermelon. And then the second photo there, you can see it says on the top watermelon raw. And then it gives you the option to change the serving size there. So for example, it didn't um, quite come out on the photo, but I put one cup diced. So you can change it to one cup, two cups, three cups. And there's also a little drop down menu where you can put on there if you wanted to do um, a, a slice, for example, a watermelon instead of a cup, you can change that too. So what I like about this is that I put in one cup and you can see it gives me the calories there and it gives me the carbohydrate estimation right there as well. So if you look down, it says total carbs would be 1.5 grams there. You can see it lists protein, calcium. So basically what this does is it gives you a nutrition label for a product that doesn't necessarily have one, which is really nice. So if you're eating out and you don't usually eat couscous, you don't know the carbs in there, you can easily search it on the database here. Um, you can also search restaurants are on here too. So you can look up a restaurant that you're eating at. Um, it does have more chain restaurants versus something that you might find near your hometown or if you're on vacation. But even if you, for example, are eating at a mom and pop Chinese food restaurant and you say, oh, well, that's not going to be on Calorie King or I can't find it online. You can always search something comparable to that, like Panda Express, for example. And so you can search that to find the carbs in chow mein. So this is just a kind of quick little look up. Um, like I said, it has a really large database, which is what I like about it. So now we're going to talk a little bit about Figui. This is the other application I mentioned. So this one is free as well. Um, you do need to register with your email and it does ask you to create a login for it as well. So you have to put your email and make a little password um, for, to access this, this, account, this specific application. So what I like about it is it actually gives you a visual for foods and it does also have some restaurants on there. It doesn't have as many as Calorie King does, but it does still have some available for you to look for. So these are some screenshots taken from the application. So you can see on the photo, the first one, it says hash brown potatoes. The serving size, it's a little small, says five ounces there. And I know it's hard to read, I just wanted you to kind of see why I like this application so you can see about something that you think you, you would benefit from. So you can see that the serving size of the hash browns is it's on a plate. So it's a visual estimation, as I mentioned, and how it works is there's a little arrow on the um, right hand side of the plate that you can toggle up or down. And what that does is it changes the serving size of the hash brown that's sitting on the plate. So and it also changes the nutrition label. So if you look at the first photo, it says for five ounces, the carbs are 40.4 grams. And then if you look at the other, the photo next to it, it's 12.5 ounces, so much larger serving. And then the carbohydrates are 101. So if you're eating at a restaurant and you're really not sure what the serving size is, you can always use this to help guide because it does give you a really nice visual of uh, the food on a plate. So I really like this. Um, this application as well for that particular reason. Like I said, I know it's hard for, for you to read, but it's just to kind of show you what it would look like if you look something up on this app. Another thing to kind of remember when you're eating out or eating at someone's home is to help with crab identification, just kind of remembering the serving sizes, what they look like. So remember a cup of something is about the size of a baseball, about the size of a, a fist, right, for females usually. And then an egg is about the same size as a quarter cup. So you can visualize that. 
and two tablespoons is about the size of a golf ball. So that's just kind of to help you identify the amount of, of carbs that you're going to take in. Okay. Now I need to say, we're going to get into, we're going to tread some murky waters here. Um, we're going to dive a little bit more into those uh, the third step of carb counting, as I had mentioned to you. So just so you know, there was a lot of information and research to sort through when talking about accounting for fat and protein with carbohydrates. Um, so currently, the studies that I was able to find are conducted on patients who with type 1, and the studies were done on patients that had a CGM, so a sensor, and also an insulin pump. Now, just because the studies were conducted on patients with pumps doesn't mean that if you're using pens or syringes, this information doesn't necessarily pertain to you. I just wanted to let everyone know that going moving forward, that that's what was reviewed in the studies, the, that it was used with patients with type 1 who had a CGM and also an insulin pump. Okay. So the American Diabetes Association, the ADA, publishes diabetes care. Now it's a journal that assists uh, healthcare providers in staying up to date with latest research and recommendations. Now in January, 2020, which was not that long ago, there was an article that was published called Insulin Dosing for Fat and Protein, Is It Time? Now this article reviewed some of the research that has been conducted on how fat and protein also affect blood sugars. So this was kind of where I started uh, my research and then moved on from there. So I just wanted to highlight that in particular, if you were curious and wanted to read the article for yourself. So we know to kind of start out in this talk that when we have carbohydrates, that um, easily goes into our bloodstream and affects our blood glucose levels. Okay. Now protein can also affect blood glucose as shown above. Now the cycle shown above is much more complicated. I tried to keep it simple so we could all understand and in the sake of time. So there's a lot of different hormones that are also involved here in the cycle. So protein, for example, converts over to amino acids, which can then affect blood glucose levels. Now fat is even more complicated than protein. Like I said, I'm just trying to keep it simple um, as you see above. So fat gets converted into free fatty acids and glycerol, which in turn can affect blood sugar levels. And another thing to remember with fat, which you may have heard before, is that fat also affects how quickly our stomach empties. So basically, if you're eating a meal that's higher in fat, that's going to delay how uh, quickly that meal empties out of your stomach and also affects your blood glucose levels. So you might be thinking, okay, so what does all this mean to me? <clears throat> so I did my very best, like I mentioned, to comb through the published journals and review them to give you a good recommendation, a solid recommendation that you can actually try. The recommendations I'm going to show you are a good place to start, I think. It's always important that if you're going to make a change to your insulin regimen um, or make a change to a setting, if you have a pump, for example, that you discuss that with whoever your diabetes care team is first. Okay. So that's always an important thing to say. So one thing that was reviewed in the article, I'll say is some good news is that there seems to be no difference in blood sugar changes based on the type of fat that you're going to be consuming. So if you're eating something with saturated fat or unsaturated fat, that didn't seem to make a difference on, um, uh, on blood sugars. So if you're eating something like, uh, bacon, for example, or a lot of avocado, you would still follow the recommendations that I'm giving that I'm going to review with you. Okay. And like I mentioned already, like many recommendations, it's going to depend on person to person. So for example, there were some studies that found that for a high fat meal, like pizza, which we all know is a high fat food, the amount of insulin required in this study was found to have ranged from 75% to 124% more than you usually take. That's a really big range. So I show you that information so you can see that it, it's difficult to just give a blanket recommendation for everyone. 
So like I mentioned, I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind that what I'm going to review with you is just maybe a good place to start. And also very important that you review this with your healthcare provider, or your diabetes um, management team. Okay, so now getting on to it. Um, so a good place to start, like I had mentioned, this is going to vary from person to person, um, would be to calculate the amount of carbs for a meal and add 20 to 30% more for a high fat meal, okay? Now a high fat meal was found to be 40 grams of fat or more. So that's what the definition of a high fat meal is, 40 grams of fat or more. And if you have a pump, you can start off by using a dual or split wave, 50% 50, um, 50 of it delivered now, 50% of it delivered over two hours. Um, so that's a good place to start in terms of um, with, the, with the dual wave or split wave. Like I said, you're going to see that that might vary for you in particular, but that's what the studies that I reviewed kind of recommended starting out. Okay. And um, that's to help really cover the reason why you they recommend splitting or doing a dual wave is because it can help cover the spike that is seen much later with higher fat meals. Now, if you're eating a very low carb meal, but very high in protein, such as steak and salad, you may notice a spike in blood sugars much later. So for this meal, you may also consider giving a small amount of insulin to avoid having a spike in blood sugars much later. So let's go through an example. So given the theme of, of, of the Hawaii virtual conference, I chose to do a loco moco. So this is a play on that. Um, it's kind of like a, it's a, it's a rice like patty. There's a beef on top of it. There's gravy, there's eggs. So there's a, it's a higher fat meal. So you can see that it's about 60 grams of carbohydrate for the loco moco and about 48 grams of fat. So because it's above the 40, right? 48 is above the 40. You're going to say that's considered to be a high fat meal. So that would mean to be conservative. We're going to start. Remember we had, I had said the 20 to 30% more, we're going to start with 20%. So I'm going to take my grams of carb, which is 60 for the meal, multiply it by 0 0.20. That gives me 12. So that means that I'm going to not be giving coverage for 60 grams of carb for this meal. I'm actually going to be covering for 72. So I'm going to do 60 plus 12, and that's going to give me 72 grams of carb instead of 60 grams of carbohydrate. So that's what you would be covering for with your insulin um, pump, for example. Okay. So just to give you kind of an example of how the calculations would actually work. So you might think, okay, well, I don't eat locomocos all the time. So what other foods are high in uh, fat would be considered high fat meals? I just kind of wanted to give you uh, some other examples. So there you see an in and out double double, you see some pizza, there's a hash brown um, scramble burrito there from Chick-fil-A, uh, sausage, egg and cheese McGriddle, and then you have a Panda Express meal that has Beijing beef, orange chicken, and fried rice. All of these would be examples of meals that are over 40 grams of fat that you would really want to make sure that you give a little bit extra for, like we talked about in the example above. Now, just some general tips when you talk about um, eating out, right, and making good choices um, to kind of reduce calories and carbs overall. It's a good idea to consider sharing an entree with somebody. Uh, also ordering non-starchy veggies to help keep full is also a good way, like a side salad or steamed broccoli, for example. Also watching the amount of chips or bread that you consume can be important. So you can ask the server just not to bring you any more bread or bring you half of the serving of the chips, for example. And if you're going to eat something special like a dessert or appetizer, maybe kind of choosing which one you're going to have for that meal. Also, don't be afraid to ask for substitutions. If you feel like, oh, you know, I'm, my meal comes with rice and potatoes, I'm going to ask for um, some asparagus instead of the potatoes, for example. Um, also, you can look up the menu ahead of time to help eliminate some stress maybe on your part. Um, you can do that like on Calorie King, like we mentioned, or even a lot of the um, chains have their nutrition menu online as well. So in summary... Um, one thing that I recommended was using phone apps to help look up carbs for meals. And that can also help you look up the fat intake if you're eating a higher fat meal, because remember it gives you the nutrition label there. So consider covering for high fat meals um, 
40 grams of fat or more is what the definition is for that with 20 to 30% more insulin. Okay. And like I mentioned before, making these changes, you want to review this with your diabetes care team. And like always we say to make sure to monitor your blood sugars, if you are going to be giving more insulin, just to be sure that you're safe. Here is a list of my references that I used in the presentation. Like I said, there was a lot of kind of data to comb through, a lot of information. Um, so this is just kind of for your reference. And then thank you all so much for listening into the presentation. I know we went through a lot of information in a short period of time, but like I mentioned, it's kind of um, important for, for you to if, if you're noticing that you get these spikes after these high fat meals to kind of maybe try at giving a little bit more. And if you have the insulin pump, like we talked about doing the, the split wave bolus is important too. Um, but like I said, it, the, it's hard to just give a blanket recommendation because it's, it's so variable from person to person. So best of luck to you all. And I hope that you enjoy your next vacation and all the new foods you're going to try or the next restaurant that you decide to try with your family.